It's amazing how effortlessly we have politicized black crime, how we have decriminalized black criminality. Just the other day, yesterday, I was driving around in my little car and I turned on NPR. The very first thing I heard was the debate. Seven people running for district attorney of Philadelphia, a dirty, dangerous, chocolate city. The very first thing I heard, and we'll hear, we'll, I'll, I'll play this in a more fuller version on May the 7th when they release the audio of what I heard yesterday. The very first thing I heard was one of the white Democratic liberal contenders for district attorney describing 400 years of institutional racism. And of course, that's why we have to remember that when we arrest people, when we sentence people, because Lord knows we arrest too many black people in Philadelphia we or convict too many black people. We send too many black people to prison, and that is all about racism. Not a word about any of the white victims of black on white criminality in Philadelphia, which is part of the DNA of that city. Not one word. And it was weird. It was like being, when you hear these debates, especially when there's seven people involved, it's kind of like you're at an auction, right? One guy says, well, I believe in 400 years of black criminality. The next guy goes, no, I believe in 4,000 years of black uh, black institutional racism that a black has kept black people down. And everybody kind of keeps taking it to the next level until, you know, until the whole thing is 100% politicized. I was thinking of that also. I'm so, you know, just a little bit, uh, I mean, today I was coming back from breakfast, Ralph's, and I turned on NPR, and, and there was another story on there. And let's just play a little snippet of it here. That's John Ridley, Academy Award-winning screenwriter of 12 Years a Slave, showrunner for the ABC drama American Crime, and director of Let It Fall, Los Angeles, 1982 to 1992, a documentary on the L.A. uprising that is premiering tonight on ABC at 9 p.m. Eastern. So 25 years ago... We have the, you know, of course, there's lots of TV shows right now about this. So on NPR, the LA riots, large scale black mob violence. And by the way, people that were there at the time, they described, they took it to a new level by saying this was large scale black mob violence directed at Koreans, the people who owned all the businesses that were targets of all this black violence. Large scale black mob violence on a criminal level. And you know, 25, and then 25 years later, all of a sudden, it's not a riot anymore. It's an uprising. A riot is a crime. An uprising is a political act. So that's what we've transformed this stuff. This is what happens to black crime over a period of time. Whatever it begins with, it ends with something else. Whatever, However criminal it begins, it ends as a political act. All, all, you know, so maybe we're just picking on Philadelphia this morning, but in the Philadelphia paper yesterday, another huge story. Uh, we, you know, we have to stop suspending child, children in Philadelphia, in Philadelphia schools because everybody knows that, fil that suspensions are disproportionately inflicted on black students and, uh, and handicapped students or challenged students, whatever the buzzword is today. Oh, and by the way, it's worth taking a minute just to remind people this whole thing about the the, the, the challenged people in a school. If you're if you're you know if, if this is the way it works in a lot of chocolate cities and a lot of chocolate school districts, if you can get your child put in a special needs class, everything changes. Plus, you get a check. So anyway, that just so happens there happens to be a lot of special needs children who are also black. Wildly out of proportion. Anyway, we can't suspend them anymore because everybody knows the suspensions are disproportionately black and that can only mean one thing, white racism. So all the kids that are in these schools that are trying to learn, all the kids who are victims of this black criminality and misbehavior wildly out of proportion, the victims, they are nothing. thinking of that this morning when the story out of Sacramento, California took a new twist. We already did a story about the two the two elder women, 84 and 61, attacked by a black man on a, on a running track up in the Sacramento area. Killed one, really hurt the other with his bare hand and his feet. There was a sexual assault involved. They caught, they caught up with him because he was involved in a third assault 
sexual assault on the same day. Let's let's catch that story because there's a lot going on in that story that we should we should take a look at. It happened again tonight. Police are revealing another attack on an elderly woman. This time it happened in Sacramento's Arden neighborhood. And tonight investigators believe it is connected to the deadly attack and murder of an 86 year old woman in North Highlands yesterday. It's really kind of creepy that someone's like out there specifically targeting elderly people. It's kind of like out of this world, really. Sacramento County Sheriff's deputies say that they have a person of interest behind bars. Good evening, I'm Sam Shane. And I'm Adrian Moore. He was arrested yesterday afternoon near Fair Oaks and Howe. That's where CBS 13's Macy Jenkins has much more on this developing story. Macy. Well, Sam and Adrian, I'm here where that 18 year old was arrested yesterday afternoon, but this was the third attack on an elderly woman in one day. Investigators are still trying to connect the dots, but say they believe the suspect's motive was sexually assaulting elderly women. 24 hours after the murder of 86 year old Fusako Petras, investigators with Sacramento County Sheriff's Department say they have a person of interest in custody. An 18 year old man arrested Wednesday afternoon near Fair Oaks and Howe. Police say the suspect sexually assaulted an elderly woman in the area out of the blue. I always see this neighborhood as on the safer side. A lot of good people live here, and uh, yeah, absolutely not. I would never expect that to happen here. Deputies say the man lives near the school and matches the description of the suspect seen attacking the two women Wednesday morning. Investigators haven't released his name yet, but we searched the arrest log at the department and found a record for an 18-year-old with a North Highlands address less than a mile from the high school. I'm total shock. Something like that should take place in a wide open area. The arrest log showed this as the arrest location. Woodside Healthcare Center, a rehabilitation facility one block from Fair Oaks and Howe. When we arrived, management told us they had no comment about anything and asked us to leave. It's just craziness. It's really kind of creepy that someone's like out there specifically targeting elderly people. It's kind of like out of this world, really. The man arrested yesterday faces two felony charges for assault and willfully causing elder abuse. But Richard Haas, who lives close to Highlands High, says whoever is responsible shouldn't be let off easy. Age is really meaningless. If it's a baby or 86-year-old woman or 100-year-old woman, they should not die before their time. So much happening in this story. First, this guy was in a rehab center. What the hell's a rehab center? Who was there? What was he doing in there? Did the neighbors... I, by the way, I know the answer to all these questions. <laughs> but did the neighbors know that a rehab center was in their neighborhood? Do you know that there's one in your neighborhood or two or three? These, like a place like Washington, D.C. is flooded with these rehab centers. They're homes, they put five, six, seven. We've done a lot of stories on these homes, especially how white kids, when they go to these homes, are brutalized by the, uh, by the black, other black inmates. Um, and so these things just pop up. And if you go, you know, they just they just pop up and nobody knows about them. But the second thing is, I mean, so the woman's going, wow. And, and the, the reporter and the people in the video are going, wow, what's up with all this? Uh, you know, isn't it weird that somebody would target old women? No, it's not weird. What's weird is that nobody, very, very few people in academia study this. And the rare case where somebody actually took a look at it it was out of Vanderbilt University. I talk about this in my book, Don't Make the Black Kids Angry, but I'll put the direct quote up there. The overwhelming majority of these old women who are raped and attacked and sexually assaulted, it's by uh, black people. And, and it's not, about, of course, it's not about rape. It's court of thought, it's not about sexual, gra well, it's not about sexual gratification. It's about rape. It's about hostility. It's about racial anger. It's about black on white hostility and anger. You know, if you're a professor at a school, you're studying sociology, criminology, you want to, you want to shorten your career right away. Do you want to get your tenure, hopes of tenure dashed forever? Go to your department chair and say, I'd like to study black criminality. I'd like to study why so many young black people sexually assault old white women. You'll be, you know, you'll be, you will be just, you, you will disappear. Your academic career will be over. You'll be teaching co beginning composition in a junior college or English as a second language.
That's what happened in this case in Sacramento. And nobody has a clue. Or if they do have a clue, they're not talking about it. You know, this we usually try to stay really current what's happening right now. But I just got something from a friend of mine in San Diego who knows the people we're going to look at. This happened two years ago, and I don't remember hearing about it at all. But it, I kind of wanted to use it here because it kind of fits in with in this theme, is that however black criminality starts out, as it did in the L.A. riots, and it started out as a big act of viol criminal violence, and all of a sudden it's turned into, you know, the uh, uprising, which is a legitimate act of political grievance. I mean, here's this guy, a black guy kills an old white dude in Seattle. They moved to Seattle from San Diego because San Diego is too much hustle bustle and too much this and that. So if you know there's too much hustle bustle in Southern California and you move to Seattle, you know, you are your you are the ultimate soft white target. That's what this guy was. Black guy tried to rob him of a phone. Uh, then he heard the guy dialing 911, went back and killed him. Well, let's just take a look at it. Justice for the family of a man murdered for his cell phone. Cairo 7 was in court when the young killer was sentenced to more than 28 years in prison. David Peterson's family addressed his killer in court this morning. Cairo 7 morning anchor John Nicely was there for the emotional sentencing. In this courtroom, 19-year-old murderer Byron White told the judge that he was okay with the judge sentencing him to whatever he deemed necessary, including the maximum. And that's exactly what the judge did. My work has suffered. My health has suffered. My heart hurts daily. Kimberly Peterson spoke of her loss in front of 19-year-old Byron White, the young man who killed her husband David of 22 years. David Peterson was walking in Seattle's Greenwood neighborhood in February 2014 when White stole his cell phone and then shot him. I want to say sorry to Mrs. Peterson. That was White apologizing to the widow in court before going on to say that wasn't the real Byron White. What was your reaction to his apology? Uh, that was appreciated, but just based on what he said afterwards, I don't necessarily know that it was heartfelt. Peterson's brother saw the detective's interview with White showing no remorse, and he says others around White likely knew he had access to a gun. The young people really need to stand up for what's right, and when they see things, uh, they need to expose them so that maybe some of this stuff can be prevented. Court records show after the murder, White commented that it wasn't even a nice phone. White's family, former classmates, and Ballard High School football coach wrote to the judge that this murder was not White's true character. Does this bring any closure for you having this, this chapter now closed as far as the sentencing? Absolutely, absolutely, you know, because I feel like I don't have to focus on this anymore. I don't want him to take up any of my time or my mind. White was sentenced to the max just under 29 years. He'll be 48 before he gets out of prison. At the end of the day, the reporter confidently told us he's going to get 29 years. He won't be out till he's, you know, such and such an age. 49, I think he said. Things change. He killed somebody. He killed him and robbed him. And you got 29 years for that. Well, we know what 20, you know, if, 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 uh, you know, if I was a car maker and I said, okay, this car is going to last for 29 years, but almost every single one I made only lasted for 14 years, half of 29, 14 and a half, I, they would run me out of business and find me like a billion, you know, billions and billions of dollars, which is kind of what they did to Volkswagen, right? They were screwing around with their numbers and made it look a lot different than they actually were. But the government sends somebody to prison for 29 years and 14 years later, they're walking around on the street and everybody goes, what the hell's that? And every single time people you know, act surprised that somebody who's in there for 29 years can get out in 14. So that's what's going to happen to this guy. He's not going to do 29 years. I don't care what that judge intends. 14 years from now, just like the LA riots, everything is going to look a lot differently. Especially in a place like Seattle, where everybody's down with the cause. You guys might not remember this, but it's one of these stories that I remember. Some people remember it. It's about an old dude up in Syracuse, New York. Bought a beer. He's in his 50s. Let's face it, you know, the guy's not going to be in anybody's, you know, most successful dudes in Syracuse list. Buys a beer, walks out to the bus stop. All of a sudden, a bunch of black people walk by and play the knockout game on him. They knock him down, laugh, run away. 
couple of them turn around. They, they, when they, they're crossing the street, they turn around. They see the guys getting up. They turn around, go back, and kick him in the face. A, knock his eyeball out of its socket. B, kill him. Most of the people involved were 15. Okay, so I don't really, I don't, you know, I just follow, I just do with the violence and I show how the reporters and the public officials are in such denial about it. I probably should do a better job of following up, but there's a mountain of stuff out there we've got to do, right? So I'm trying to focus on just what's happening right now. Two years later, this was, so this would have been just last year, there was a story in the paper up in uh, Syracuse where people were going, hey, you know, th th there was a story about a guy who threatened to kill his principal and uh, threatened to kill his principal and then he got kicked out of school a couple of later, days later, he's back doing the same thing again. And people go, what's the kid doing in school? He just threatened to kill his principal. And somebody else said, oh no, it's way worse than that. He's one of the kids who, who, kill, who kicked that dude in the face and killed him, the old white dude. Did a couple years in the, in the slammer. They got till they got to the age of 18 when he had to let him go. Boom, he's back in high school. That's how crazy it is. That's how insane this whole thing that's surrounding black criminality. It's always something relieving somebody for responsibility for what is happening. I was talking to a couple of people the other day about something in Wilmington, Delaware. And I don't like to talk about Wilmington because I think it's special. I talk about Wilmington, my little hometown, because it's ordinary. And that's why I live here. I see this violence and denial every day. Violence, denial, violence, denial. And so uh, a guy was talking about how, you know, well, one of the reasons that Wilmington is so screwed up is they built a bridge through the middle of Wilmington. And they built the freeway right through the middle in the early 60s. I remember going down there, I'd see the, you know, building the bridge, I'd be underneath there fishing. About 20 years later, some brainiac from the University of Delaware discovered that, well, when they build that hot freeway right through the middle of Wilmington, they took out to take out a city to a city or block or two of houses. And that is why Wilmington turned into a dirty, dark, dangerous chocolate city that news we call Murder Town USA. That's why, because of the freeway. Didn't have anything to do with uh, the, the black criminality wildly out of proportion, didn't have anything to do with black people driving white people out of Wilmington because of this criminality, nothing to do with anything. It's all about the freeway. So people just make it up as they go along. I mean, how many cities are there like Wilmington? How many hundreds and hundreds of cities are there in this country like Wilmington, Camden, New Jersey, Baltimore, Washington? But all these cities have other cities surrounding them, right? Wilmington, no matter what anybody here thinks, is basically a suburb of Philadelphia. See all these cities around Philly, you got Reading, Allentown, all of them have, all of them have the same quality of, uh, uh, of large black populations, high crime, and white people that are just have their head on a swivel every minute of every day because black and white hostility is mainstream and black and white crime is just part of the DNA of those towns. But everybody, you know, but everybody comes up with these little fairy tales. Oh, there's a bridge going, there's a freeway going through your city. That's why the black people are killing and hurting the white people on such a massive scale. That's why. Hey, whatever gets you through the night, I don't care. As long as it doesn't make the black kids angry.